as well. Now I do see out there some people who don't really look like the standard MSc students. Um, I think you might be maybe some of Mark's former colleagues, whoever you are, we welcome you. Um, there are a couple of things that we do at the start of in-person events. Um, if there are, is a fire alarm, uh, exit through both of the doors. Um, everyone should now, if you haven't already, turn your phone off. Remember, we had used to have to do that. Um, turn your phone off. And also, just to let you know, this is being um, simultaneously shown on Zoom, and that Zoom, record, that Zoom call is being recorded. So everybody should understand that you are being recorded um, and that that will be available later on the department's YouTube channel if things work out, which we hope they will. We have a lot of experience with this now. But let me welcome you then. We are here for the London launch of Mark Lowcock's book, Relief Chief, A Manifesto for Saving Lives in Dire Times. I think we can all see what a timely book this is and how important it is that this would be coming out. Now, um, I'm welcoming, welcoming you on behalf of the Department of International Development, where I'm a professor and head of department. My name is Kathy Hostetler, and I will be chairing the event today and introducing our various speakers and letting you know how things work. But let me start by first inviting LSE's director, uh, Manu Shafik, to do the first introduction to our speaker. And the reason we've asked that is not only because she's had a distinguished career herself in both the public sector and also now in academia, but she's apparently an old friend of Mark's. And so we're hoping to um, have that insight from her in this first introduction. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kathy, and um, it's such a pleasure to welcome all of you here. Now, as Kathy implied, I um, I have had the pleasure of working with Mark Lowcock since 2004, uh, when we were together at the Department for International Development, and it's such a treat for me to see so many former colleagues from DFID here, as well as LSE students. I note, Kathy, that your department is keeping the DFID brand alive <laughs> since you are the Department for International Development and long may it rain. Um, now, how about Mark? So there are a few people I know who are more dedicated to the cause of development and humanitarian issues than Mark. He has spent his life working in the poorest parts of the world and for the cause of development, most recently as the UN Undersecretary for Humanitarian Affairs and the Emergency Relief Coordinator. And there, were, there are two traits that I very much associate with Mark. One is that he's very brainy and analytical uh, and applies that to everything he does, uh, which is why he's a perfect fit to have as a visiting professor of practice at the London School of Economics, where being brainy and analytical is about the most important thing. Um, his second is his political skills. We used to joke at DFID that Mark was the only person we knew who could see around two corners. And you can see from reading his book, his ability to anticipate risk and be strategic in thinking about how to solve intractable problems uh, was essential. What's really special about this book is his vantage point. Uh, he is someone who has been at the front lines of the major humanitarian crises of recent decades. And he, he gives a sense of the complicated politics that lies behind what mm -hmm. should be rather straightforward issues of how do you keep people safe? How do you keep them fed? And how do you give them shelter and care in a humanitarian crisis? And he, he reveals that politics to us and it gives us a much deeper understanding of how challenging these problems are. And of course, as Kathy implied, because of Ukraine, these issues are, are incredibly heightened at the moment. But of course, Mark was there for all of those crises that aren't in the headlines. And that's the other thing that's so striking about the book is the long-term nature of many of these crises and how intractable they are. And he analyzes them and you come away with huge admiration for his remarkable resilience and his deep insight into the issues that underlay the, underlie these problems and actually how we can save lives in dire times. The book is, makes sometimes for frustrating reading and depressing reading, but it's also very hopeful. It's hopeful because of the heroism of the refugees who are in these situations and for the heroism of those fighting for them. And Mark is one of those heroes. 
And so I am very delighted to have him here at the London School of Economics today. Over to you, Kathy. We were so happy that Manoush could do the first introduction because I met Mark only a little over a year ago, really, when we started talking about him coming to join the Department of International Development as a visiting professor in practice. And I, if I take away nothing else, I think this rebranding of us as DFID, there's a bit of a gap there that I think we might be able to fill. That rebranding of us as DFID might be something we can use as a department. But Mark has been a particularly welcome contributor this year to our MSc program in International Development and Humanitarian Emergencies. And also beyond that program, uh, that's a program that Dr. Stuart Gordon sitting at the table and Dr. Ian Madison are co-convening this year. There are about 90 students in the program, some of whom I see here in this room. And he was such a good fit with that program because of this concern about the intersection of development and humanitarianism and the compassion and the, and the passion for this work. So we were very excited about being able to bring him in to a group of students that share very much those kinds of ideals and concerns. We have one of our current IDHE students, Anna Landry, actually just won the LSE Volunteer of the Year Award for her work that is being that she's doing currently to help coordinate evacuations of people with disabilities from Ukraine. And of course, we have a long history of our current and former students who have done similarly impressive kinds of activities. And we really hope for that for all of you. And we're glad that Mark could be here this year to, to model that. So we're very proud of our students and very proud of this program and very proud of having Mark uh, with us this year. This year then, well, you probably don't need much of an introduction to Mark if you're here. So you probably know him in one setting or another, but I will formally um, make some of the, uh, uh, identify some of those highlights. It is, as I said, the London launch of his most recent book, uh, Relief Chief. It's not his first book. He has uh, other writings. Before that, he was, as Manoush said, the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator ending at the United Nations, ending in 2021. And I was very impressed to see that he was the longest serving holder of the post of permanent secretary of UK's DFID. Um, that's a long time that you were at DFID and with all of the different roles that Mark played in the organization before then, there's really 26 years that he spent at DFID and a lot of different positions that he played there, which many of you actually probably know better than I do. So we very much welcome his former colleagues. I think we all know the depth of his experience and Manoush gave us some more dimensions of that, but we really welcome here, him here to um, present this book, which comes out of this highly distinguished and accomplished career that he's had. And we're very pleased to have him here today. In terms of the format for the book launch, we're going to be starting with some highlights from the book from Sir Mark himself. And then Ian Madison will be coming on to make some responses to the book and to raise some questions he's told me about the book for Mark. And um, Dr. Ian Madison is, is currently an LSE fellow in international development and humanitarian emergencies and co-convener of this master's program. He was a former MSc student in the program himself, if you're wondering what happens to former students <laughs> in this program, um, and now has more recently earned a PhD in international development from the University of Oxford. His own research is on the politics of citizenship and public service delivery in conflict and disaster areas and did his field work in Kosovo and Tanzania. So after Mark does an initial introduction to the book, then Ian will follow with some comments and questions. That will take roughly half an hour. Um, and then we'll be opening the floor to questions. And just to let you know in advance how that part of this will go, we'll be taking a set of questions from the room first. And then after Mark's reply, we'll go to our online audience and take questions from there. Anna Dalton is bringing those in for us and then back to the room. So we will have some chances for you to ask Mark questions as a follow-up. Um, just as a reminder, we always encourage people to keep those questions succinct and respectful and remembering that we have a global audience for these kinds of events. Um, but after that then, we have yet more time here in the building. There will be some refreshments and drinks outside and that will be a chance to mingle informally between um, those of you maybe now in DFID, 
those who might want to be there eventually. Well, you're not in DFID anymore, but, um, but, but, but people who are working at different stages in the field of international development, um, we really encourage you to intermingle and mix, meet each other in addition to having the chance to talk more with, with Mark and Ian and others in the room. So all of the people at this talk in whatever format, online and in person, you're very much welcome. And we look forward to your participation, starting with Mark. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. Both in the room and uh, online. It's great to be here. And when I was an undergraduate studying economics in Oxford University, I went one time to a lecture given by Amartya Sen about the work of John Hicks. John Hicks, who at that time was in his eighties, was one of the main interpreters and users of. Um, Maynard Keynes's economic theories. And so Sen gave this brilliant lecture, as you would expect those of you who've come across his work. And um, there were various comments and stuff. And then John Hicks was invited at the end to uh, say anything he wanted to say. And what he said was, um, he felt a bit like a famous surgeon who had invented a new life-saving operation, only to find that he himself needed the operation and was woken up halfway through the operation to be asked by the people who taught the operation how he thought it was going. <laughs> so you've heard quite a bit about the book and me now, and I, I'm not sure there's all that much I really want to add <laughs> because, uh, because you've heard what you've heard. I do want very much to thank uh, Minouche and Kathy Stewart, who runs the MSC program, who we work with a lot on, the, uh, on that program, Ian, who's about to comment, and also especially Anna, and Deepa, who made a lot of the arrangements for today. I also want to thank all my colleagues at the Centre for Global Development, some of whom are watching us um, from on, online, I know. Um, I, I work now um, about a day a week at the Centre for Global Development, and they've published the book. And whatever you think about the, um, the way it's inside the book, I hope you will agree it's a handsome <laughs> And that has absolutely nothing to do with me. That's all down to the CGD team, especially um, Emily Schabacher, who I particularly want to thank, who coordinated the editing and production um, process. So I wrote this book partly, I um, admit, as a form of catharsis. I was the um, 12 people before me had been the head of humanitarian affairs at the UN, so I was the lucky 13th winner. winner. Uh, they had served an average of um, two years each. All of them, I know, because I spoke to almost all of them. There's one person I couldn't speak to who'd been killed when the uh, when extremists bombed the um, UN in Iraq in 2003. I spoke to all the rest of them, and they all told me they had done the book in the most challenging times. They had, they had done the job in the most challenging times, and I understood that. They all served an average of two years each, and I did it for, for four years. And um, so I admit there's an element of catharsis and recovery <laughs> in having written the book, and Minouche has given you a bit of an insight into um, why that might have been the case. But the main reason I wrote the book was that, because although I am a very strong supporter of humanitarian agencies, and, and I know and see that they reach 100 million people a year, and they certainly save millions of lives every year, and the world would be much worse without them. When I left the UN, I was, I was struck by two things that, um, did really disturb me. The first thing was that really for the first time in my lifetime, things are going backwards in the poorest countries of the world. The global poverty rate for the first time in the 60 years that I've been alive has started to increase in recent years. And a symptom of that is these growing volumes of humanitarian um, problems in the most vulnerable um, places. Um, and humanitarian agencies are basically overwhelmed now by trying to deal with an ever-growing volume of um, crises. Um, and um, that creates a huge problem. And it, it, left, it was a problem that left me disturbed. And I wanted to write about and try to describe why, why I thought that was happening. The second Second reason I wanted to write the book, though, was although I'm a big fan of humanitarian agencies and I think they do a good job, I think they could do a much better job. And what I tried to do in the book, why, why the manifesto words in the title, is set out a hundred things basically 
that would be doable and practical and achievable. So not the pie in the sky list, the doable list, which the agencies could do to make things better. Um, and I'll say a little bit, a little bit more about that. Now, this is just the structure of the book, for those of you who want the, the kind of fluffless guide to, to what's in it, the straight it starts with um, a rather long description of the five month process through which I was um, appointed to the job. And actually, it illustrates the point that Minouche made that the environment for, for these activities and this work is very, very political. And you can like that, you can think it's a good thing or a bad thing, but you have to deal with it. And the long saga of my appointment to this job was very, very political. And I told the story of it, partly because it's about the only place in the book where there's any jokes and the whole saga is a bit of a farce. Um, I told the story of it because I thought it was important for people to understand the context in which everything else um, took place. And then there's an introduction to the book which describes basically the origins of the humanitarian system, where it comes from, and why it's structured in the way it's structured. Because if you're designing it now, you wouldn't design it in the way in the way we all see it. But it's important if you want to reform it to understand where it comes from and why it is the way it is. Part one of the book then is a description, a story really, of in the 2017 to 2021 period when it was my responsibility how we were trying to deal with some of the very biggest crises. So the first chapter deals with the tragedy of the Rohingya. When I was packing my bags at home to at the, at the end of August of 2017, getting ready on the 1st of September to fly to New York to start work, I was watching, like lots of you, on the TV screen, hundreds of thousands of Rohingya fleeing from persecution and um, violence from Myanmar and, and quite a big issue I was dealing with for um, the whole of my four years was looking after those people when they got to um, refuge and safety in uh, northern Bangladesh and the challenges of that. There's then um, a quite extended chapter on um, or Antonio Guterres, who was my boss as a Secretary General, called The Stupid War in Yemen. And that is... Um, a chapter I wrote because Yemen was the biggest humanitarian crisis in terms of the number of people who, who wouldn't have survived without humanitarian assistance and also the death toll probably in the four years I was um, at the UN and dealing with that crisis was extremely frustrating mostly because it was clear that the people with the power and influence on all sides, the Yemeni parties, um, the external actors really had the interests of the people of Yemen at the bottom of their list of priorities and forcing them to consider the interests of ordinary people um, I thought was a, was a it was a real challenge and uh, was, was the reason why we could never get Yemen beyond being the world's worst humanitarian crisis. There's then um, a long chapter about the many atrocities of Syria which it's the biggest humanitarian crisis that the world has coped with um, for generations, actually. Half the population fled um, either inside the country or many, many of them, a third of the population became refugees. It saw a uh, re-emergence for the first time since the Second World War of um, behaviours that many people thought had been extinguished from the human condition. The, the reintroduction, for example, of wide-scale sieges to starve people into submission. They resumed use for the first time by military forces of chemical weapons. Um, and the UN's uh, role in trying to look after 20 million people affected by that crisis, which is not, it's not in the headlines anymore, but, but it's still there, it hasn't got much better for the population of Syria, was uh, fraught with moral and political and ethical and all sorts of other dilemmas. And it created huge new issues that development agencies, humanitarian agencies had to think about. And the trade-offs are one of the um, things I thought it was important to try to um, describe in that chapter. There's then a, a chapter about what I call the looming um, um, crisis of the Sahel, because I've been going to the Sahel, Sahelian countries, for more than 30 years now. When I think about the long-term challenges, that is the region which worries me most, because the causes of its problems, which are to do with poverty and population growth and stresses on environmental assets and poor governance, are creating the space for violence and extremists 
And what's being dealt with is the symptoms, in other words, people fleeing get food, but not the causes. And that is a surefire recipe for failure. To deal with the symptoms and not the causes, things are going to get worse. And the Sahel is not the only place where that's the case, but it exemplifies, um, it exemplifies the issues. There's then a chapter on um, the Horn of Africa and famines. My first job in the mid-1980s was working on famine relief in Ethiopia, uh, where a million people lost their lives in Ethiopia in 1984 to 5. And um, when I came into this job at the UN, I wanted to be part of a continued effort to eradicate famine from the human condition. Famines only now happen in the world as a result of a deliberate choice, a deliberate choice by, by powerful people, men with guns and bombs, to start populations into subjugation or, if necessary, out of existence. Famines don't have to happen. Um, and the, the, one of the main places where they, they are still a major risk, and, and as we know now, they are really back on the um, agenda and we'll run into multiple famines if something isn't done. One of the main places where that happens is the one of Africa. I then wrote a chapter about dealing with sudden onset disasters, floods and storms and earthquakes and so on. They happen every day everywhere in the world. And the first thing that I had to do every morning when I woke up in this job was check my phone to find out where is the latest one and will the UN need to be engaged. Actually, the story of dealing with those disasters is a story of huge improvement. Far fewer people die in those sorts of events now than used to be the case. And in the job I was doing at the UN, it was tempting to think everything was getting worse everywhere all the time. In fact, that wasn't true. Some things were getting better, and so I talked a bit about that as well. And the second half of the book deals with the themes, really, around which I thought we needed to work to make the, the humanitarian system better. So I had quite a big challenge in managerial issues in the office I inherited, and there's quite a long chapter about that and why the, the UN works in the way it does and why it isn't uh, more efficient and effective and what we try to do about it. There's a long chapter about modernising humanitarian finance. Humanitarian response is very reactive, and it doesn't have to be, because lots of the problems we're dealing with are predictable and can be anticipated. And we made a big effort to try to use more of the concepts of anticipatory action, insurance-based concepts, if you like, to get better, cheaper, more humane responses by modernizing the humanitarian financing system. There's then a chapter which has become horribly more apposite now because of what Putin has done in Ukraine about the growing widespread flouting of the laws of war. What Putin's doing in Ukraine is straight out of the Syria playbook. Um, and it's become a huge problem for humanitarian agencies that the understood deal under which they would operate, which is starts with no one will try and kill humanitarian workers in, in conflicts, and they should always be allowed to um, go in and do their work. Those rules are not being respected. And that's the biggest reason why it's hard to deal adequately with the crisis. So I talked a lot about what we can do about that in the chapter on wars and laws. There's then a, a chapter on women and girls. Women and girls are always um, the population groups who suffer most in humanitarian crises. That's always been true. Until quite recently, it has rarely been acted on adequately. Um, women and girls need different help in crises um, because they're subject to different problems. They need help with maternal um, reproductive health care, for example. They're subject to a lot more sexual violence than men and boys are. They need help with that. But, but, they, um, but they also um, need to be um, thought about from the outset, and that hasn't been the way that humanitarian uh, agencies have typically worked. When I was at the UN, these issues became very prominent because uh, in 2018, Oxfam found themselves in the middle of a huge crisis because they were revealed not to have dealt adequately um, with abusive behaviour against women and girls by men who'd been working for Oxfam in 2010 in Haiti. Those men were allowed to go and do other jobs in other places. So we tried to use this crisis to reform the whole of the humanitarian system as well as get better attention to women and girls. There's then um, a chapter on the pandemic. And the pandemic changed everything. It had the one very positive effect of getting me off international airlines. Um, because I used to be 
on a plane almost every day doing this job. And I instead, for the last year or so, I was working for the UN. I was hunkered down in my tiny two bedroom apartment on the 30th floor of a tower block in New York, looking in one direction at the UN building where no one was, because no one was going to work in it, and then over the East River. What, and one, the thing we learned, of course, was that um, you could still do a lot in those environments. But dealing with the pandemic was incredibly frustrating for development humanitarian agencies, because there were loads of things that could have been done to protect poorer countries and had been done in the 2007-8 financial crisis, and weren't done this time. So I uh, to tell that story in the pandemic chapter. And then there's a final chapter about how to build a better humanitarian system. And the most important thing that chapter says is a core structural problem with the humanitarian system is that the power is between the donors and the agencies. The accountability chain runs in that direction. The people who are all supposed to be trying to help are nowhere in that. So if you want to make one structural change, it would be to give people, the agencies are supposed to be helping, more voice. And I set out some um, ideas on how we could do that. Um, if you don't, there are four very quick takeaways from the book. If you don't remember anything else, I hope you remember these four things. Firstly, humanitarian agencies do a good job. They save a lot of lives. Secondly, but they are overwhelmed. Thirdly, the reason for that is because the causes of the problems they're dealing with are not being addressed. And fourthly, most importantly, and this is what I learned from talking to hundreds and hundreds of men and women and children caught up in these crises all around the world over the whole of the period I was doing the job. The people caught up in these crises are exactly the same as the rest of us. They have exactly the same hopes and aspirations and fears and anxieties. And I told a lot of their stories and what they said in the book. The only difference between them and us is that life's lottery has been cruel to them and kind to us. And if there's a single motivation for why we should care about um, these issues, um, that I think is the most powerful and important one. Thank you. Thank you. I think that brief introduction made many of us want to read the book, and it has. So let's hear from someone who's looked at the book. I can confirm I read the book. <laughs> In short, I'll say I liked it. <laughs> Not one of the most descriptive things you could put on the book jacket, but I, I really liked it. Um, I found this a really powerful book, and I think it raises some key, almost fundamental questions for thinking about humanitarianism more broadly. And I'd like to kind of uh, raise some of these with you and just see some of them are, are uh, inherent in the book, but some of them, as you mentioned, have, have been raised in, in, since you published the book. I think the first thing, you know, I find this a work of reflection from which I've learned a lot. And I, I have a lot of sympathy for you, judging on, again, thinking you, you were just mentioning how in, in, in one year you traveled to and from the United States, I think 50 times. So uh, the, the level of jet lag you're dealing with, I'm sure you're still getting over it. Um, and you, you lay out this really ambitious program for reform. Um, and I think, so in, in, on the one hand, this is a work of optimism. You are optimistic. And you do say fundamentally, the system works. It's a system that's saving hundreds of thousands of people. It's really important to highlight that, I think. There's a lot of critiques around the humanitarian system. It's unwieldy. It's short-sighted, it's paternalistic at best, maybe neo-imperialistic at worst, um, but this is also a system that's deeply self-critical. It's always trying to learn. And I think your uh, reforms, while in this position, are a testament to that. This is also a word of frustration. And that's something that really came across. I think we should, we should we share that. And I think both in the terms of this, the, the limits of the United Nations as an international organization, it can facilitate, it can't enforce. It can save lives, but only when people with guns allow it and only when there's someone who's willing to pay for it. The other thing that comes through, I think, from the, from the very beginning of the book right to the end, is a real burning sense of injustice and impunity. 
right from the beginning, we're talking about people's demand for justice and the way that a lot of people are getting away with outrageous, outrageous uh, 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 crimes. These are, these are some of the themes that, that jumped out at me. Now, I want to circle back to these in, in kind of a, a, a one, one way or another. But, you know, in the spirit of, you know, with Stuart, I have the opportunity to teach on our international development and humanitarian emergencies program. So in the spirit of a complex, multi-casal uh, uh, emergency, I'm going to throw all my questions at you at once <laughs> and uh, create a sense of crisis. <laughs> okay, the first one is around principles, humanitarian principles. And one of the things that for, for the students in the room that we talk a lot about in our courses is the importance of humanitarian principles. And I think all of us now have this ingrained in our, in our, in our brains at some level. Humanitarian actors should be impartial, they should be neutral, they should rise above politics just to address suffering. This is the idea. And I think there's a moral element there too, right? They're better than politics. They should lower themselves to that physical uh, space. At the same time, as you highlight, you see this increasing politicization of humanitarian action. The humanitarian space is shrinking, I think best exemplified by the tragic targeting and killing of aid workers in countries like Yemen or Syria. Now, you could say one call to action could be we need to go back to those core humanitarian principles. That's the best way to ensure that space, to access those populations in need. But what you are saying in this book is actually we need to engage much more in the political. So what I want to ask you is what does this look like in practice? How can we balance these humanitarian principles with this need to engage at a political level? Okay, second question. These are just little questions. <laughs> Second question comes to a key critique. There's lots of critiques to the humanitarian system, but one that has become especially relevant recently is calls to decolonize the humanitarian system. Now, one of the things that jumped out, again, coming back to this frustration, is how important a unified security council is to access populations. In, in your chapter on Syria, I think, is a, a really interesting insight to that. When everyone comes together, you can actually gain access to important populations that you otherwise wouldn't have been able to. Now, such unity is rare. It won't surprise anyone, especially now. Um, and I think there's a big critique around the Security Council that this no longer reflects the world that we live in. This is an outdated, outdated system. I think there's a corresponding critique to the humanitarian aid system as well. Massive international organizations and NGOs headquartered in the global north, working in the global south, disproportionately staffed or led by white people who are making decisions of life and death often for people of color. Now, this system is not representative of the people that it seeks to help. So a characteristic of your position at the UN is that there's an informal system where it's reserved for a UK national. And I want to ask you, do you find this an anachronism? And if so, how can we reform this? What steps would you take to make sure that this system can be more representative, can be more accountable and give more voice to people in need? Uh, as I said, just light little questions. The third one um, isn't so much based on your book, but it, it kind of coming back to this, this theme of crisis. There's two really big crises that you talk about in your book. First one, COVID. The second one, uh, climate change. You talk more specifically about COVID, but climate change, I think, is inherent throughout all the chapters of the way. And I think some of the things you've done in terms of the largest ever UN appeal during COVID-19 to support 63 countries with their response, in terms of climate change, as you mentioned, this push towards more anticipatory action things like uh, disaster risk insurance. These are major steps of reform in terms of addressing these two crises. The third crisis, though, is what I want to get to. And we've already had a chance to talk about this a little bit a couple of weeks ago. But coming back to the invasion of Ukraine, what do you think are the implications for the humanitarian system of this third enormous, potentially pivotal uh, crisis? 
that's everything. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, well, the great thing about um, being asked 25 impossible questions um, and having five minutes is no one can expect you to do justice to all of them. And let me just say, there's a really important uh, questions. Thank you very much. Let me just say a couple of things about, um, about each of them. Um, I, um, when I started doing the job and wanted to go to a country, everybody would let me in. By the time I finished doing the job and wanted to go to countries, quite a bunch of, quite a lot of countries wouldn't let me in. Uh, the government of Syria in particular stopped giving me a visa from the beginning of 2019. And the consequence of that was I was doing too much in their eyes of what you were sort of describing, Ian. In other words, I thought it was necessary to um, describe in a fair and accurate way, but we, 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 by definition, a political way, what was happening. Um, and I had 30 memorable mornings or afternoons in the Security Council with them on the, just on Syria. I'd, I spent 100 mornings or afternoons overall in the Security Council, and 30 of them on Syria. And um, of course, the risk that that creates is, um, well, are the other humanitarian organizations gonna stop being able to operate um, in the same way that, you know, I wasn't being given these in. And so the pragmatic way people have found their way through that is to have a kind of division of labor. In each environment, there's a kind of implicit understanding. And Antonio Guterres actually was very, very good at organizing this and we would work out in quite an explicit way who it was who was going to be calling out the atrocities and who might not be talking so loudly publicly about those things because they needed to sustain access for their um, operations and that is one of the ways in which i think you have to engage given the um the world we operate in but it's a huge huge mistake not to be calling out violations and atrocities. Um, and somehow the world's going to need a conversation about how we remind ourselves about why in the first place we created this humanitarian system, we signed up to the laws we did. Because a lot of them have their origin in self-interest. Humanitarian law started in the middle of the 19th century when people organizing armies to fight on battlefields of Europe decided it was in each of their interests to have rules that when someone was wounded, they could be rescued or civilians shouldn't be attacked. And the reason they did that was not out of human empathy mostly. It was because each side realized that in order to get young men to keep going to the battlefield, they had to convince them if they got injured, someone might help them. So the origins of the system are in interests and one of the things we're going to have to do in the light of what Putin's done is have rehab that conversation I think um, on um, just the fact that the system is not representative I mean you're entirely right uh, of the now 14 people who've been the relief chief only one is from a southern country um, five have been from the UK there have been lots of Nordics there have been two Japanese there have been a Canadian and so on um, and what that comes from is the cold, hard reality that most of the money provided to reach those 100 million people a year and save those millions of lives is provided voluntarily, mostly by Western countries. So if you're the Secretary General of the UN and you have to work out who's going to do what job, you face a bit of a wicked dilemma. Now, there's a lot that we, you can do across the system as a whole to get more representation. And in fact, to his credit, Antonio Guterres has made enormous progress on that. And inside, inside Ultra, when I was there, we did two things, basically. Firstly, we got to a position where, when I arrived, a quarter of the senior jobs were held by women, and when I left, half of them were held by women. And that had huge, huge consequences. There's not many things you have complete control over if you're running a UN agency, but one of them is who does what job most of the time, not, not totally. So you, that's something you can do something about. And the same with um, people doing jobs from southern countries. So that, that you have to definitely need to do more of that in order to sustain the um, credibility and the legitimacy of the system. You do also though have to manage this trade-off with the money. If you can't raise any money, there's nothing you can do. 
So that is, you need to be honest about that. Um, I think that Ukraine is a paradigm shifting, game changing event. Um, I think the um, it will be, uh, you know, the consequences of it we will be dealing with for decades. It um, has shone a light on how some of the values we thought were universal turn out not to be universal. And as I said earlier, some of the choices the Russians have made deliberately to bomb civilian refugees, deliberately to um, attack maternity hospitals, um, you know, some of the other choices they've made and the atrocities that have been revealed uh, are, are things that happened in Syria. So we're going to need to get back into that conversation. This has, had, this has also had a huge impact on the viability of the multilateral system. The G20 is basically no longer functioning. And it's difficult to see how we're going to recover from that. In the financial crisis 2008-9, the G20 as a group made a huge contribution uh, to supporting the poorer countries. That, you know, we're in a moment of flux with that big group of countries which account for 80% of world economic activity um, and therefore have big voices in multilateral institutions. One of the things that's going to be really interesting to see is for those um, organized, those countries which are um, Western in their outlook, who are represented by the EU and the OECD and the G7, and who have a predominant voice in some of the major multilateral organizations like the World Bank and the IFIs, how are they going to use their ability to um, you know, get a lot of stuff done collectively, even in the absence of engagement from others in the G20, like China, Russia, India, uh, and so on. Are they going to do it in a way which was, um, you know, the main, the main kind of mindset up to um, the beginning of this century, which is basically trying to use those values to promote, uh, those institutions to promote their are they going to take a slightly more sophisticated approach where they um, recognize that large parts of the world are coming from a different place and may need to be supported in a, in a way which is, um, I'm thinking here particularly of African countries and poorer countries in parts of, of Asia, um, may need to be supported in a, in a way that recognizes better we're not in the immediate post-colonial era. And, it's very interesting to me how in the last few weeks, the Western response on Ukraine has stopped being mostly about support for Ukraine and has started to be more about support for a much larger group of countries who are being devastated by the food, fuel, fertilizer crisis created by what Putin's done in Ukraine. And I think that's a, that is a more positive sign and it wasn't what was happening in the first week or so of the first month or so of the crisis. Oh, well, that took care of those questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, both of you, um, for starting us out so well. And we have a bit more than half an hour now to go to questions from the audience, both in the room and online. So I'm going to take an initial block from people in the room, and then we'll ask for a block of three questions from online, if those are there. So those of you who are online can be preparing your questions now. Those of you who are in the room asking questions, please wait to ask your question until we until a microphone is brought to you, just to make sure that everybody in the room can hear. So we think we have a couple of microphone walkers here. Where, where did they go, Anna? Okay. All right. So I see a first hand there and a second hand there uh, in, in the brown and a third in the green. So and then you'll be in the next round, I promise. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, my name's John Burton. I should declare I'm a former colleague of Mark from his day. And I should say, if you could introduce yourselves just like John just did, that would be great. I'm a, so please, sorry, yeah. I'm a former colleague of Mark from his different days. I just wanted to ask about resourcing for humanitarian aid because you have the pot of money, which is called ODA, and then you carve out the humanitarian budget from the ODA. So anybody who advocates for an increase in humanitarian funding is advocating, therefore, for a reduction in development aid. And I just wondered if that's a good way of 
funding the system and also have we got the balance right are we putting too much into development aid at the expense of humanitarian or, or vice versa thank you okay thank you and then in the brown well, thank you for that uh, fascinating presentation. My name is Soraina Pasha. I was a former visiting fellow at the LSE Sociology Department. Um, I was wondering if you have any reflections on the current humanitarian crises in Afghanistan, um, in particular the role of uh, Western governments in essentially uh, creating this crisis to some extent. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And then in the green... Yeah. Can someone make sure that microphone is turned on? Because I'm not sure that it is. Okay. Hello. Hi, uh, thank you for the great uh, talk and the introduction to the book. Um, I'm Leon. I'm an MSc Development Studies student at SOAS. And um, I wanted to ask you um, also, first of all, what do you think is the impact of the UK aid budget cuts on the humanitarian funding and the humanitarian system? And secondly, um, you just mentioned is sort of like which part of the budget should go to development and which one should go to communitarianism. But I would like to ask, should we make that distinction in the first place anyways? And especially with dealing with protracted crises, how do you assess the role of the triple nexus and triple nexus programming to sort of integrate the two and kind of overcome like this silo data approach? Um, great, well, Jeffrey, question. So thank you very much. And what, so what John has described that um, there's a fixed budget and you have to choose within it for uses. It's the, it's the system in the UK and it's the system in a number of other European countries. It's not the system everywhere. It's not, for example, the system in Gulf countries or in the US. Um, and so, you know, the I think having a 0.7% target is a good thing. Um, but one of the disadvantages of it is if you're not willing to adjust the amount of spend as problems ebb or grow, you do face the trade-off you describe. Um, and it's a wicked dilemma, um, and there's no scientific answer to it. I, I don't think it's tolerable in the modern world for there to be a humanitarian crisis in which millions of people are allowed to die in a way which could be prevented because you don't want to redirect some of your development budget. So I think when there's a, a mass life-threatening event, and this is one of the reasons, by the way, why um, famines, which used to happen very frequently all around the world, are, are now very rare and only happen because men with guns and bombs decide they want them to happen. In other circumstances, they're prevented, and often aid budgets are used to prevent them. And that probably is the, is the best thing to do. But it, it, some flexibility in the overall level of spend, I think, is, is sensible. I spent a lot of time between, well, really since 2003, traveling to Afghanistan. And um, I don't think any of us should pretend that for the huge bulk majority of the population of Afghanistan, having the Taliban back is an improvement. It's a terrible thing for most people in the country, especially for women and girls. And the West, um, obviously there's gonna be a long process of learning and thinking and reflecting on that, um, I, I don't think um, the West has been very clever in tying itself up in so many knots over the use of sanctions. Uh, so the fact that it's so difficult for Afghanistan to import food because they can't get access to foreign exchange, ask yourself the question, who are the people suffering most from that? I promise you it's the women and girls of Afghanistan. So. I do think the West needs to be a little bit more sophisticated and think through consequences. But I do have a lot of sympathy for people in Western capitals who, who complain that all eyes swivel to them rather than say to Beijing or India or other neighboring countries when we see bad things happening in Afghanistan and wonder who should do something about them. Um, and that, and of course, the dysfunctionality of the G20 makes that much more difficult to have a collective, um, collective approach. Um, the long version of my answer to the question on the aid cuts is um, in uh, an article I wrote for the Times newspaper yesterday with Peter Ricketts, who used to be the head of the um, Foreign Office uh, and then was Britain's National Security uh, Council, where we were we were offering a not very positive assessment of the international development strategy 
the British government published yesterday. Britain is the only country, only rich country that in the middle of the pandemic slashed its aid budget. Everybody else protected them or increased them, partly for reasons to do with moral empathy, but partly for longer term national interest reasons, because countries have worked out Actually, the planet is quite small. Problems in one place will spill over unless you contain them. Um, my assumption is that at some point the UK will normalise its way of handling these issues. And um, I certainly hope that's the case because it would be in Britain's national interest as well as a kind of signal of, um, of empathy um, and so on. On the, um, I, I, you're entirely right that these there's an arbitrary distinction between the humanitarian and development. And I describe in the book some of the problems that arbitrary distinction creates. Um, and there's a there's huge cultural divides actually, which I didn't understand before I arrived at the UN, um, having spent a career mostly in development, as I do now. There the humanitarian folk are from one tribe and the development folk from another tribe and they don't always speak to each other or play nicely in the sandbox with each other and that's a huge problem and there's a lot that could be done to address it which again I tried to set out in the book. Okay, thank you um, and we'll go to Anna now to see if there are questions from online or a little bit um, hesitant I think no questions yet on zoom so okay it's, it's very interesting these hybrid events I was at one on Tuesday night where almost everybody was online and hardly anyone in room here we have this great group of people in the room. So I know we have one question. Um, if you still have your question, we'll start with you. But let me also identify the next two questions. So there's a second question there and a third question there. Now I see that hand, so we'll come back to you. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Rebecca Martin. I'm also um, MSc in Development Studies from SOAS. So, uh, <laughs> um, actually, I think yeah, I, I was going to ask about the protracted uh, refugee situation, and I think you partially answered that. That you know, I mean, it seems to me there should be more of a division between what is relief aid and what is development, especially since uh, you know some of these people are in the camps for decades. You know, so um, okay. That's it. I don't know if you want to follow up anymore on that. And then can you take it to the gentleman here in the jacket? Thank you. Mr. Siddiqui, I too got to work with both Mark and Manoush at different. So Mark, often large organizations have a narrative that comes down from the top and it doesn't always match the reality on the ground. And it's often that senior management choose not to consider alternative scenarios which would make us better place to deal with issues. So obviously with Afghanistan, we had one single narrative and then it went over a cliff and we didn't practice contingency. How do you change the nature of large organizations so that they will challenge and then champion and adapt to alternative scenarios? Sure, they might not have the resources, although big organizations do, but they can at least put in more contingency than we saw with Afghanistan. Um, if I can ask a second question quickly. Um, yes, we are seeing developing countries who will struggle to both feed and fuel themselves. And then later down the road, I think you will see debt default for these countries. When that happens, they're in a very weak position to negotiate. And when they do have to negotiate, concessions are wrung out of them. How do we deal with that situation? Okay, thank you. And then the Browns are here. Right behind you. Hi, yeah, I'm Sophie. Um, I'm a graduate of uh, MSc Strategic Communications, and uh, I did a placement in Difford before you were there. Oh, I'm sorry, way after you were there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, my. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm great skin care regimen. Um, <laughs> no, the, the question I wanted to ask is sort of between the intersection between international development and communications. Um, how can we sort of responsibly tell the story of the beneficiaries and people that we want to benefit? Because I think, you know, sort of over the years, uh, fundraising campaigns have, you know, perpetuated stereotypes in ways that are quite irresponsible, but often sort of, you know, um, existing in a good place of trying to raise those funds quickly, but um, it has implications to how the West, you know, views developing countries. That's a question. 
Um, so, as was alluded to earlier, one of the biggest problems humanitarian aid is facing at the moment is most of the particular crises they're dealing with are very long lasting. And displacement in particular has tended to become a very long term problem. Uh, and uh, I remember going in early 2017 to Darfur um, in Western Sudan. I've been trying to go there for a long time actually, but because because I feel like working for at the time, the then Sudanese authority would never let me in. <laughs> anyway, eventually they let me go, and I went to Darfur, and I went to a, a camp for displaced people, and they'd been displaced for, in some cases, 10 years. And the converse, normally, when you go to see um, displaced people or refugees around the world, they want to have a conversation mostly about how they're going to escape from this ghastly situation they're in and get a chance either to go home or, re or rebuild their lives somewhere else. And the conversation I had that day in Darfur was a different conversation. Most people wanted to know why their rations weren't as big as they were for people in Syria, um, why there weren't more um, IT facilities in the camp, and basically why in the place they were, things couldn't be made better for them. And, and the, that was because having been displaced for 10 years, those people's agency and their ability to have any power over their own lives had been completely eroded. It basically been taken away from them. And one of the things I talk about a lot in the book is one thing the world needs to do is take more risks in having faster solutions for displaced people. It's a bit like the point I made about let's try to give a bigger voice to people who are the victims and survivors of these crises to have a bit more control over their own lives for all sorts of reasons. Um, and um, unfortunately, we're not doing very well at that bit of the uh, challenge. We need to try to do better on anything. I, I mean, I agree that aid agencies and big organizations in general would do better if they were more responsive to local information and local knowledge. Being decentralized makes you a bit more likely to do that and delegating power to the local level. Um, but it's a constant challenge and dilemma um, that every organization has to try to um, get to grips with. And you just need to keep working away at it actually, because the things you need to do are different in one place to the other place. You're entirely right, there's another debt crisis coming. And it's going to be a much more difficult debt crisis to deal with than the one that some of us in the room spent a lot of time dealing with in the 80s and 90s, because the creditors are different this time. Actually, the, the basic problem is quite similar. Lots of countries don't have the fiscal space or ability to borrow to deal with problems that are getting worse, especially food crisis. So they need some relief to their debts. And it's fundamentally a fiscal problem and a, a problem of inadequate economic growth. The, the problem, what is different this time though, is, is the creditors are not the same. The creditors in the 80s and 90s were mostly official agencies or Western countries, and they could get together. Um, now, the, there are two huge new groups of creditors. Firstly, China is the biggest lender to many of the most indebted countries. And secondly, there's a lot of private lending. And if you want to have an effective approach to debt relief, you need a system which has all the creditors in the room. Because no one creditor or group of creditors will want to relieve debts if other people are getting a free ride. And that's proving a very difficult problem to deal with. There's one or two glints of hope. I think the fact that the Chinese seem to be willing to have a discussion about Zambian debt is a positive sign. And there are ways to get the private sector creditors better to the table, largely by the political weight and power that the governments of the countries where most of them are registered or have their origins um, you know, can bring to bear. So in other words, governments in Washington and London and a few other places could do more to get private creditors to the table. I do think this is going to have to be addressed and dealt with, um, but of course the dysfunctionality of the G20 doesn't, doesn't make it any easier. And I mean, Sophie, I completely agree. There's a real challenge of communicating about things in a way which 
um, creates a sense that people are victims or um, not being, that they're, that they're, they're not like the rest of us. And I think one of the best ways to resist that is to tell people stories in their own words or, or, or um, have them tell their, their own stories. It's one of the reasons in the book why I had lots of stories about what people said to me and what they wanted and, um, you know, the, the their version of events, if you like. And one, one of the things you get if you communicate like that is you plug into the empathy of the audience. Um, the human species, for all its weaknesses, is an empathetic species. And when people hear about bad things happening to others, you know, they frequently want to try to find something to do about it. And if you communicate in that way, probably you'll do a bit better. Okay. Anna, are we still quiet online? Well, we actually had one or two people who raised hands and they might have just missed in the chat function that if you could type your questions in, then we'll be able to read them out just to make sure everybody can hear you. So I have Gebra Kirtos with a raised hand, but if you could type your question in, then How I'm about if we do another round in the exactly. room and then we'll come back to them? So there was a shirt and the V-neck sweater there, and a Manoush here in the front. And then I see a green shirt there, and you'll be the first in the next round. Uh, Mark, thanks very much for that. Uh, Mark and I were colleagues at DFID. My name is Jim Drummond. Um, I think you probably touched on both of these points I was going to make. Um, the first was, how do you generate an incentive for reform in the humanitarian system? Uh, you know, we've all sort of had a go at this in the past. And the humanitarian principles discussion and the moral pull takes you so far, but it doesn't always deliver what seems sensible. Um, secondly, I think it's fantastic that uh, the LSE is keeping DFID alive. <laughs> um, but I wondered if you had any further reflections on how to keep the UK's voice loud in the current circumstances on humanitarian issues. Okay, thanks. And could you bring the microphone around? Just yeah. bring the microphone. Oh, do we just share in the front? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Just on, on the note that I'm, you know, should be getting the director of LSE. Uh, on the note that Jim said, I couldn't help resist sharing the story I heard from a senior US policy maker when we were complaining about how pathetic the international response was to COVID and getting vaccines to poor countries. And this person said to me, you know, if DFID had been around, the global response would have been better because you would have been beating us up about doing more and you would have corralled an international response, which nobody did. It's an interesting conversation. But I actually have a question for you, Mark. Um, on the on, on the, uh, the use of insurance-based mechanisms to stabilize financing in response to humanitarian crisis, the World Bank issued pandemic bonds, which were supposed to deliver funding for in the case of a pandemic, which I think are widely seem to have not been successful. Uh, in fact, uh, Claire Lennon, one of our faculty here at the LSE who in health policy has written a lot about why they failed. So I wanted to ask you, given the lessons of that experience, are there some good examples out there where an insurance-based approach to humanitarian financing could work? Okay. And then our third one in this round is the green shirt there, I think. Hello, um, thank you so much for speaking. My name is Devin Leslie. I'm a, I'm a master's student with international development and humanitarian emergencies. And I had a question um, kind of combining some of the comments made um, concerning the viability of the multilateral system, the entrenchment of power structures that benefit the very few. And then you mentioned um, trying to lean towards more the human empathy. But I think I can speak for a lot of people with every crisis that comes, we're kind of you know, the compassion exhaustion is, is a real issue, you know, as every new crisis comes forward. So is there a way forward for the humanitarian system when the people that you need to lean on for empathy are becoming exhausted and the power structures that need to do something are only working for the very few? Only the easy questions. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, questions. So as Jim says, it, 
it is it isn't always straightforward to create incentives for reform but actually um, the humanitarian system has improved a lot over recent decades and the reason it's improved a lot is because people have generated good ideas and provided compelling evidence and shown policymakers you'll achieve more less expensively if you do these few basic things and actually quite a lot of progress has been made on proving some of the concepts around um, anticipatory financing that would be one example so if you, if you want to get something done and change the incentives you need good ideas and good analysis you also need a degree of persistence in in um pursuing but, it, but there has been progress made and it's possible to get more progress um i one of my future projects which i've been offered some help from a major foundation with is to think about the lessons from the 23 years of experience of dfid's existence and how those lessons might um inform the uk's future arrangements i mean the fact is no other big country has done what the uk has decided to do not just in terms of the aid cuts but but in um the the what, what i think is now most generally referred to as the submerger um of dfid into the foreign office and that the reason no one else has done that is because running a diplomatic service is a completely different thing to running a development budget rory stewart put this um very well when asked this question um, a while ago um when he said look the army is not the navy and you know i provided a similar answer when i was interviewed for a thing that was published in i news earlier in the week the education department and the health department may both be about people but they are actually different things and um i think the country at the moment needs a much better diplomatic capability and if it's going to have an aid program which you should it should run it professionally and i think at some point that will get this i do think that will get disentangled and a lot will um you know matter about the details of how it's done and i'm looking forward to talking to lots of people who used to work for dfid and maybe some who now still work in fcdo about what would the menu or ingredients or core principles be if you get a chance to rethink this because i, I do think that there's at least a 50 percent chance that in the next three years it will be put onto a different basis that would be my guess um i and so as minouche says some of the insurance experiments have failed the pandemic bonds is an example of that um and it, what it illustrates i think is the difficulty of structuring the deal in exactly the right way um and particularly for health related crises that's that has proved difficult examples of where insurance has been used very successfully is uh, are often in the area of sudden onset storms or earthquakes or floods or those kinds of things and lots of caribbean countries or pacific countries have taken out um, insurance policies which pay out instantly it's a bit like the fact that most of us here who have a house have house insurance um, the house being burned down is a low probability but very high impact event the deal with our insurance companies is if it happens it's very visible and they'll pay out straight away so most of the humanitarian disasters which are insurable have those characteristics i think but my point about insurance is not that this is mostly about privately taken out insurance policies it's more that the concept of insurance um, where you um you apply the fact that there's some events out there that might happen and you decide you want a contingency plan in place before they happen and some money available to deal with them those insurance concepts without necessarily having a private sector policy taken out to deal with them those i think have very wide application um, and in particular the international financial institutions could have much bigger um, pools of money they hold back for contingency financing 
when a bad event happens. And that basic concept, so when there's a drought, we know what the consequences would be. You could release the money much earlier than waiting to see the starving children on the TV screen. That, that concept has huge application, uh, I think, and it starts to be proven on a, on a wider scale um, recently. I mean, I think Devin, Devin's point exposes one of the fundamental structural challenges of the humanitarian sector that if you just you know think about its place in the United Nations, if you if you want to be a country joining the United Nations, you have to pay a subscription and you have to pay a contribution to meet the cost of the United Nations. That includes having to pay towards the costs of peacekeeping operations when the UN um, asks countries to provide thousands of soldiers to go and keep the peace, as is, as is um, still being done in 10 or 12 countries around the world at the moment. Countries in the UN, if you want to be in the UN, you have no choice but to pay towards the cost of that. The humanitarian endeavor, on the other hand, is completely voluntary. Nobody has to contribute to humanitarian action. And uh, one of the proposals I've made in the book is to change that, at least for um, the UN's Central Emergency Response Fund, which is a fund, well, when I was in the UN, we got to about a billion dollars a year in fundraising, to change that so that everybody had to contribute on an assessed basis, according to the size of their country's share of the world economy. Now, do I think that's about to happen? Well, not not given the state of geopolitical um, relations. But it, it, it's not impossible um, in a few years' time when maybe we've escaped from Ukraine and people learn the right lessons for that kind of thing to happen. But unless the burden is shared more fairly, um, <coughs> the, the sort of fundamental dilemma that you describe is a permanent feature, unfortunately. And do we have questions now online? Yes, I do have a question. I also still have one raised hand. So to that person, if you can type it in the chat, that'd be great and I'll read it for you. But I have a question from Helena, who's a student at Oxford. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Hello, Helena. Oh yeah, okay. So I have a question from Helena, who's a student at Oxford University. This is where Sir Mark. What would you recommend for a young person who's looking to work in the humanitarian system and how best to navigate the flaws that you've identified given that they're largely systemic? Yes. Uh, well, of course, lots of um, the students in the room who've done the master's program have done the master's program partly um, in order to position themselves, I think, for doing this kind of work. And, you know, I would just say, I'm sure we need to experience this the same. If you want to choose a profession or an area to work in, um, if you work in international development or humanitarian response, you're guaranteed to have a life experience not short of frustrations, but you're also guaranteed to have a life experience where what you're getting up to do every day does make a difference. And it's, it's, you know, it's intellectually extremely stimulating, but the fact that you can feel good about getting up to try and do something about these problems every day makes going to work for 40 years um, easier than it might otherwise be. So don't be deterred by the challenges or the, uh, the fact that it can be hard to get into. This is a great way to spend your professional life. I'm glad, you know, I, when I left university, I could have gone to train to be a teacher, which I think is a wonderful thing to do, or I could have trained to be an accountant, which is probably a you know, a productive thing to do. <laughs> um, or I could have come to work in development, and I'm so thrilled I made the right choice because it's been a, it's been a huge privilege. Um, the, the, so firstly, I would encourage young people to get well qualified. So those of you who've come onto the master's program, you've done the first smart thing because qualifications and understanding really matters. And uh, those, I mean, so far, I know people listening to this are either wisely students at the LSE or SOAS, which is a great school, or um, Oxford, which is a university where I was educated. You've made, you've made great choices between those three. But there's lots of other good places you can go to be educated. The second thing, uh, I think, is to try to get some experience in a country where there are problems. Um, and there are a variety of ways to do that with um, 
international NGOs or with um, other kinds of organizations. I wouldn't particularly recommend as a first thing for young people, you know, to go to Syria or Eastern Ukraine. Um, I think there's some very acute, dangerous places where you don't want to have your first experience. But having some field experience is a really, really important thing to do. I, I, I absolutely commend that. And on the question of the fact that there are lots of systemic issues and challenges that you're dealing with, of course, the, the, the thing you're trying to do is address those underlying systemic challenges and hold on to the fact that compared with 60 years ago, uh, when I was born, the average life experience for people on the planet is hugely better than it was then. It's gone back backwards in the last few years, as I said, but it's hugely better than it used to be just a tiny step backwards in human history. And that's not mostly because of aid agencies. It's mostly because of science and technology and the spread of benefits of innovation and economic and management through market-based systems and so on. But aid agencies, development agencies have done a lot actually to spread those benefits farther to a much larger number of people and places. So, um, you know, the challenge for each generation is to work out what bit of the systemic problems they most need to try and confront and work with people um, on that agenda. And it's absolutely possible to make progress. Very glad to have had an answer to that question, which of course we have all the time in the department. <laughs> so I think we have time for one last quick round of questions before we go to a more informal setting where we can talk informally. I see two hands there together. So there's two people there and a third one here. So we'll take that as our final round. And then, as I say, there will be refreshments outside and we can talk more informally from there. Go ahead. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm one of our only uh, MSC purposes program for the MSC. Um, if we do move, as you suggested, as I hope, from a system of donor accountability towards more beneficiary accountability, um, I hope the system also becomes more engaged in better identifying its, the ethical nature of its imperative. Um, however, I wanted to ask about how humanitarian system can be managed within sort of system of pluralistic imperatives as, a, as I think they are and often they're not only pluralistic but they're based on irreducible, irreducible ends so we have the imperative to save lives we also have an imperative to improve lives and increasingly as we're recognizing more forms of vulnerability on choosing which life to save and which life to improve um what do you think yeah ask you about humanitarian management within such a, a complex particularly with limited um, budgets. Okay, thanks. And can you pass your microphone on there, please? Thank you. Um, I'm merely I'm on the same course. Um, I was wondering, in reference to your comments on um, root causes and responsibility in um, the humanitarian aid um, sector, um, humanitarianism is often accused of being quite a historical. Um, and I was just wondering, how can we and or should we um, create the space in, in the humanitarian sector for historical responsibility, um, which is a theme that we've talked a lot about recently, especially in terms of reference to, for example, Afghanistan. Um, and I was just wondering what the how this might work, whether it's already present, um, or whether a move away from historical responsibility towards a historicism presents some opportunities for humanitarianism, or it's just a very dangerous and unproductive way to go about things. Thanks. And then we have one last question here in the front in the blue shirt. You. <laughs> right here. I guess all the mics are going there. Hi, uh, my name is Zoe. I'm in the International Development Humanitarian Emergencies Program. Um, my question relates to the first question, actually, um, about a, a, the cost effectiveness discourse in humanitarianism that I think is not only pervasive, but foundational and seems to be where most decisions spring from. Um, I'm wondering, is that, do you think, uh, Sir Mark, do you think that that's a result of kind of the backwards accountability system that you um, mentioned, or is that a necessary part of this sort of work? Um, it seems to me like it's feeding into the issue you've brought up multiple times with treating the symptoms rather than the causes, since the symptoms are cheaper to treat than the causes are. Um, so I'm wondering 
is that something that is necessary within this work or is, is that something that we can move beyond? Okay, um, you, so you've asked that some of the most powerful and complicated and difficult to get to grips with questions in that last round. There. So um, I'm not, I, you know, please have realistic expectations. <laughs> um, the, you know, the philosophical underpinnings of, um, you know, why you should do certain things and what you should do, I have to confess is, is, you know, not something I feel very um, confident about espousing. Um, I think it's really important to ask the questions. I'm not sure there are clear black and white answers to them. I do think it, you know, the process of asking the questions leads you on to other questions, which maybe have clearer operational implications. But I guess the consequence of being of somebody who has spent, um, you know, my working life in practical with practical responsibilities is I tended to focus down on the yes, but what are we actually going to do on this particular case today and tomorrow? And I think that you know you make a good point where you say, well, yeah, but, but let's ask some of the more philosophical questions as well. And um, the um, it is always a good idea to try to be as explicit as possible about the trade-offs and the values and the perspective you're bringing to something. Um, it is a, a disadvantage being somebody who is um, an accountant who went to business school and trained in economics, um, that you tend to think that at some point you're going to have to confront the resource challenges and the costs of things and whether some things cost more than other things and how to make trade-offs. And I confess, personally, I am in favour of things which provide the biggest benefit to the larger, largest numbers of people. Um, and that sort of aggregation of a utilitarian concept is, you know, not without its problems. I, I, I do accept that. But um, I haven't seen a, a sort of better way of thinking about what to do in particular circumstances. But recognizing there are other ways of thinking about challenges is more likely to get to get you to a, a better response than not thinking about that. Um, I, I think that um, a failure to understand the history and origins of problems is a huge um, critique to be made of um, humanitarian development agencies. Um, that is slightly different to an examination of who is to blame or who caused what problem. And I, I, um, I feel much more comfortable saying that the whole sector should engage much more heavily in understanding why things are the way they are than I do it in saying our starting point should be who caused what problem and how do we get them to remedy it. Um, again, that's probably a reflection of having spent, as we knew said at the beginning, the whole of my life trying to navigate political environments and wanting at least something to be done um, in difficult, um, you know, when you're dealing with difficult um, problems and circumstances. Um, so that's probably the best I can do on those, those kind of philosophical um, very, very challenging questions. I would really encourage you to um, look at what Amartya Sen has said about these uh, sets of issues. I think, um, you know, he's, he's clearly a genius, a brilliant man. He does distill and um, develops a very powerful taxonomy of how you might think about them better, particularly in development as freedom and um, some of his later writings, The Origins of Justice and those kind of books. I think we all can hear quite clearly that Mark is a very convincing and interesting scholar of these issues. And there are copies of the book outside for sale. People are interested in picking it up today and, and reading it at your leisure. But in the meantime, let me thank Mark for 
uh, having chosen to do the London launch of his book here at the LSC, and thanks to Ian for the comments and Manoush for the introduction, and we thank you all for coming and being such a great audience and asking so many interesting questions, and um, please join me in a round of applause and then stay with us. Thank <laughs> you.